Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Executive Director of the National Building Museum, Chase Rind, and Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the National Building Museum, Gary Haney. Good evening and welcome. Gary and I would like to welcome all of you to the National Building Museum's annual gala and our 2017 Honor Award celebration. This event has become the keystone of our year, a unique, memorable, and fun evening that brings together our greatest friends, partners, and supporters under one roof. And it is one hell of a roof, isn't it? It's a good one. It keeps us dry. So we are, we're delighted that you have joined us, not only to celebrate the National Building Museum, but also the remarkable accomplishments of this year's Honor Award recipients, the National Endowment for the Arts and Brookfield Properties. This year, we are also pleased to pay special tribute to Richard T. Anderson for his service to the New York Building Congress. Dick is a longtime friend of the museum, a current trustee, and we feel truly honored to be able to recognize his amazing accomplishments tonight. It is rather remarkable to consider how we got here. Way back in 1980, when we were all just kids, an act of Congress established the National Building Museum to be the nation's premier institution dedicated to showcasing achievements in the building arts and sciences including architecture, engineering, construction, landscape, interior design, and urban planning, along with all of the other uh, building-related disciplines that you represent. We were placed in this incredible building, and since then we have grown and grown, developing an impressive roster of internationally acclaimed exhibitions and award-winning education programs that inspire, engage, and educate more than a half a million visitors of all ages and backgrounds every year. Every day, this museum serves as a forum for examining the most critical issues in the built environment and their impact on our lives, from the importance of historic preservation, to access to affordable housing, to sustainable and resilient design. Throughout the year, we welcome tens of thousands of young students to learn about these issues through school programs, and we engage professionals and adult learners in dozens of lectures, panel discussions, and off-site adventures. Our exhibitions and our increasingly popular summer installations capture imaginations and encourage visitors to seek further involvement in our built world. We are seeing an increased international visibility through collaborations with a range of international institutions. We are so proud to once again welcome the growing Ambassadors Circle, a group composed of our neighboring dipl diplomatic leaders who share an interest in advancing the building arts and sciences, not only in our community, but throughout the world. I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to His Excellency Martin de Hinden, Ambassador of Switzerland, who is chair of our, our Ambassador Circle. Welcome, Ambassador. Thank you. And a special welcome to fellow members of our ambassador circle, Ambassador Wolfgang Waldner of Austria and Ambassador Hannah Schuger of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Thank you, ambassadors. Thank you. Uh, and please note the other participating embassies listed in your printed program. I would also like to recognize the DC Council members who are serving on this year's Honorary Committee and who are with us tonight. Chairman Phil Mendelson, Phil, and Council Member Jack Evans. Thank you both. All of you supporting us here tonight make our work and our mission possible. As I look out on the crowd, I am honored to note that many of you have been with us from the beginning and I am counting on you to stick with us for the next 37 years. Gary? Thanks, Chase. It's great to see so many familiar faces here, and thank you all for coming. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, welcome, 
and I thank you for your support of tonight's gala and the National Building Museum. Tonight we recognize two exemplary honorees, the National Endowment for the Arts and Brookfield Properties, both of whom have touched our lives in many ways. They are joining a prestigious list of previous honor award recipients who have had a great effect on the built environment, including Lady Bird Johnson, the Rockefeller family, and the Walt Disney Company, to name a few. Both of these honorees are leaders with remarkable achievements in building our cities and the arts. Collectively, their legacy is profound in advancing the quality of the built environment. I'm pleased to recognize several former honor awardees here this evening. We're grateful for their continuing support and enthusiasm for the museum, the Associated General Contractors of America, Clark Construction Group, CoStar Group, Davis Construction, Forest City, Perkins and Will, Studios Architecture, and Turner Construction. I would also like to recognize my colleagues on the Building Museum Board of Trustees. Your work to ensure the success of this year's campaign is truly appreciated. Thank you for your commitment and your generous support of this institution. I would like to give a special thanks to Jim Davis, who led this year's gala effort. Helping Jim, uh, the gala committee, Jeffrey Abramson, Joan Kalambakitis, John Coleman, Jean Giordano, Barry DePaul, Tom Glass, Tony Greenberg, Phil Harrison, Sabrina, and Steve Sander. Thanks to you all. Could you, could the board members rise so that we could see you? I know it's awkward, but everybody stand up. There we go. Thank you for being here tonight and all you do for the museum. Um, another thank you, a final thank you to you all who've come out here on this beautiful night and to honor our incredible honorees. This is going to be a fun evening, I promise. Thank you. I, I promise we'll let you get to your dinner soon. Uh, no doubt to the terror of the museum staff, I'm, I'm going to go off script a little bit here. I'm going to skip the formal comments about the museum that they provided me and, and speak a little bit more from the heart. So I, I am sure that we would all agree that this building is a terrific place for parties. Uh, Lord knows I've been to plenty of them myself, to a lot of great remarkable events here, and I'm sure you have too. It's fun to be here, to celebrate occasions and to see the building decked out like there's no tomorrow. But all of that is only one small part of who we are and what we do. If you have not visited us recently during the day, then you have not witnessed the amazing variety of activities that go on in this building every day, all day, seven days a week. This very great hall often serves as the largest classroom in the city, buzzing with young people working together to build a geodesic dome or figuring out how to protect a raw egg from splattering on the floor when they craft an egg carrier and drop it from the second floor. Sometimes they actually succeed. It's pretty remarkable. At least four days a year, we offer programs for homeschooling families. The demand in the city is huge and uh, we sell out every time. 
And then we have three incredible teen programs. These are multi-week uh, programs with great mentors, with challenging subject matter, and revealing to these young people a path to a design or building career. Our education partners are innumerable, from Title I schools to public libraries to the National Park Service. Add to that our family festivals, our summer block parties, and all of our public lectures. And then, of course, we have our roster of changing exhibitions that are invariably critically acclaimed. And our prizes, the Turner Prize and the Scully Prize, that recognize great achievements in our world. I would go on, I could go on, but I won't. Um, but I do hope my point is clear. Your being here, your financial support, is what makes all of this amazing stuff happen. You really have to see it to believe it. And I invite you to visit any time, and we can reveal to you what you have helped make happen in this very building. So on that note, it is most appropriate this evening to acknowledge and thank this evening's major sponsors. I'm going to read them really fast because it's a long list and we have to get to dinner. So, lead partner, Brookfield Properties, partner, Jim and Sharon Todd, benefactor sponsors, Bender Foundation, Buyer Blinder Bell Architects and Planners, Clark Construction Group, George Corey and Cynthia Cruz, CoStar Group, Davis Construction, DLR Group Sorg, Gensler, Glass Construction, HDR Architecture, International Masonry Institute and the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers, Perkins and Will, Studios Architecture, The Tower Companies, and Turner Construction Company. And our media sponsor for the evening is Washingtonian Magazine. Thank you all for your tremendous support. Our work here would, just would not be possible without you. So as you just heard, we benefit from the generosity of terrific individuals, as well as organizations from all sectors of the building industry, corporations, associations, and unions. And I want to specifically note that unions played a, an important role in the founding of this museum. So I want to make a special welcome to our, our building trade guests tonight. Now with that, I would like to invite you to turn your attention to the screens for a very brief film about the museum. Thank you. It began with an idea to create a national home for the building arts and sciences and at the same time, save an architectural treasure. This idea led to the founding of the National Building Museum in 1980. The National Building Museum is America's leading cultural institution devoted to the history and impact of our built environment. Fitting to its mission, the museum is housed in one of the most impressive buildings in America, featuring interior columns among the largest in the world. Here, visitors of all ages take part in exhibitions, public programs, and festivals, experiencing the wonder of architecture, design, engineering, construction, and landscape architecture, the industries that create our cities and communities. The museum is a forum for public conversation on critical challenges like sustainability, disaster resilience, affordable housing, and historic preservation. The National Building Museum, the place where ideas are born. So it is a, it's a, a true pleasure to be able to share uh, all that we do with you. Um, as you can see, we have quite a bit going on and we are certainly much more than a gorgeous building. But now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our MC for the evening, our friend, the incredibly smart, funny, and witty Paula Poundstone, who, save your applause, she hasn't even started yet. But I have to tell you, Paula has a new book out. I just happen to have an advanced copy that just hit the shelves. The Totally Unscientific Study of the Search for Human Happiness. It's all about happiness, which of course we could all use more of. It just so happens that uh, the book is available in our shop, so if you want to pop by after dinner, you're welcome to. But I have to tell you, 
this will bring you to tears. Tears of hilarity, tears of empathy and sadness, and tears of joy. It is just a marvelous book. So on that note, please welcome Paula Poundstone. All right, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. It is a nice building. I love what you've done with it. What did it used to be, Chase? When it was built, it was for writing the checks to the, the pension building. <laughs> Remember when there were pensions? Yeah, I think the fact that this was turned into a building museum was the first hint, really, that we had that pensions were gonna be a thing of the past. Uh, I, I'm so excited to be here. I, I, uh, I, I'm thrilled to be in a room with ambassadors. At my table is the ambassador from Austria, for heaven's sakes. I know nothing about Austria. <laughs> that's why, I mean, that's why the, uh, the ambassador thing is such a great idea. Uh, the only thing I know about Austria is sound of music. <laughs> I assume it's more than that, is it not? We always thought, um, uh, are, now, the puppet show in The Sound of Music, did you ever have something like that when you were a kid? Do you remember the puppet show from The Sound of Music? Uh, am I the only one who remember? Oh, so I'm, look I'm looking at totally the wrong guy. I'm so sorry. Oh my God, you were almost forced into service as the ambassador from Austria. Were you panicking because you realized you know nothing about Austria? What's your name, sir? I'm so sorry. I was sitting at the table and I, I, I got the wrong table. Um, what's your name, sir? Hollis. And what do you do, sir? I'm retired. You're retired? What did you retire from? Freddie Mac. Freddie Mac? Uh, the makeup company? <laughs> <laughs> what, didn't a bad thing happen with Freddie Mac? Is that a, a lot of bad things? <laughs> Which really opens you up for your ambassadorship. <laughs> and, all right, I'm an idiot. So the, excuse me, sir, the ambassador of Austria is right over here. I wondered why you look so embarrassed at that idea when I mentioned it. Uh, but here is the ambassador from Austria. And you, sir, did you, when you were growing up, have that puppet show come with the high on the hill is a lonely goatard? It's an American movie? <laughs> Wasn't it even shot there? Didn't they make it in Austria? But it's an American conception of what Austria is like. Uh huh. For example, did you ever have clothing made out of the curtains from your bedroom? <laughs> no. You see, that's why we're so glad that you're here because those are the impressions that we've been left with. And didn't, did Chase say the kingdom of ne the Netherlands? I didn't even know it was a kingdom. Is it, the, the, the kingdom of uh, the Netherlands ambassador, is he over at that table? Oh, right over, I always have the wrong table. I was making that guy over there be you. Um, and, and well, first of all, welcome. How long will you live here then? For four years. Um, and uh, do we go back to the kingdom of the net? When did it become a kingdom? <laughs> it's not on my globe. Uh, 1815, yeah, well I have an old globe. <laughs> well, anyways, uh, welcome. I'm, I'm so glad that you could all be here and it's very nice to be back. Uh, I know nothing about architecture so this makes me the perfect person. I am to architecture what he is to Austria. <laughs> uh, well, we're gonna start the evening off with a special tribute to Richard T. Anderson, President Emeritus of the New York Building Congress. I didn't even know there was a New York Building Congress. I'm assuming there's a lot of scandal that goes with that. <laughs> Do you get elected to the New York Building Congress? Does no one here know anything about the New York Building Congress? I'm looking for backup here. Austria guy, do you have an Austria Building Congress? Not, not that you know of. 
Well, you've been here for a while. Things have taken off since you left. Every day they have the puppet show. Uh, anyways, I think we have a film uh, 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 about this guy. Do we not? Am I right about that? Are they gonna, do I say like roll the film? Okay, roll the film. Richard Theodore Anderson was born in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, a neighborhood that was a hub for Scandinavian immigrants. From an early age, Anderson was fascinated by buildings. His father worked at a large construction company. Anderson pursued his passions in college, attending Rutgers University and earning a degree in urban planning. He later obtained a master's in planning from Cornell University. What followed was a lifetime of advocacy in support of strategic infrastructure investment and economic development, promoting the long-term growth of America's cities, New York chief among them. In 1994, Anderson became the president of the New York Building Congress, a coalition of business, labor, nonprofit, and government organizations promoting the design, construction, and real estate industry in New York City. The next 22 years were a period of unprecedented influence and growth for the organization. Anderson grew the organization's membership, promoted long-term capital investment in the city, worked to keep construction costs down, and to maintain job growth within the industry. The National Building Museum salutes Richard T. Anderson for his outstanding contribution to the modern revitalization of our great cities. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick has been a friend and supporter of the National Building Museum since 1994. It's approximately a, a hundred years or so uh, after uh, uh, the Netherlands became a kingdom. He currently serves on the Board of Trustees and has played an important role in many of the museum's achievements through the years. But beyond his incredible support of the museum, tonight we pay tribute to Dick for his 20 years of dedicated service to the New York Building Congress, his steadfast commitment to the building industry, all of the construction trades and professionals that are shaping our sky lanes and communities. Please turn your, oh, I think we already did turn our team. So now we're turning our attention uh, uh, to the man himself, Richard T. Anderson. Please join me in congratulating him on his work and great legacy. Thank you, Paula. I wore this white dinner jacket for Paula Poundstone. I wanted her to know that somebody has respect for her. <laughs> thank you, Chase. Thank you, Gary. Thank you all for this wonderful evening. Um, I really appreciate working with the National Building Museum because we at the New York Building Congress share the same constituency. We've got the leading architects, engineers, contractors, real estate folks, labor unions, same as you do. Uh, and what a marvelous industry it is. This is the industry that creates the built environment. And we have a lot to be proud of. And I have appreciated working with the Building Congress in New York and with my colleagues uh, around the country uh, because we do create such wonderful, wonderful uh, edifices. But I'd like to leave you uh, with one thought. If there's ever a time to think big, it's now. Do you know in New York, we just completed the first new bridge in New York, new major bridge in 50 years, the Kosciuszko Bridge. Not since the Verrazano Bridge have we had a new bridge. We have such an unmet agenda of infrastructure to be, to be dealt with. And we can't be building institutions that will wall us apart, keep us uh, apart. We need to build uh, uh, institutions and bridges and tunnels that bring us together. Now's the time to do that. Now's the time to think about it.
Thank you very much for this honor. It's very much appreciated. I look forward to the rest of the evening and to congratulating the other honorees. Richard Anderson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And now it's my job to tell you, uh, enjoy dinner. I already had the salad. It was spectacular. And for a while, I was avoiding the round-looking things that I thought were olives. But it turns out some of them are grapes. All right, see you in a little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Paula Poundstone. Thank you very much. How was your dinner? Uh, let's have a nice round of applause for the people who uh, made us dinner and served it to us tonight. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Banquet service always amazes me. You know, that everybody gets a meal at the same, uh, having worked restaurants for many years. Uh, that's a remarkable thing. I'll, uh, if there's, uh, and I'm assuming that, 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 that the, uh, the food service people have all been treated delightfully this evening, but on the off chance that there's someone in the wait staff that has not been treated correctly, let me just give you a tip. When I used to wait tables, uh, I remember one time I was waiting and there was these two women sitting at a table and they were kind of rude to me. And they both ordered a Coke and it was the old gun kind. And uh, so I brought the Cokes to their table and just before I left, I said, oh, I'm sorry. And I switched them around. And then I stood back and waited to see how long it took them to drink those sodas. I hadn't done anything to them, but I just... And they were the exact same. I just said, oh, my mistake. I figured if they called the manager over, what, what were they going to say? She switched our sodas around? It was a no harm, no foul crime. Uh, anyways, uh, I, my dinner was delicious, by the way, in case you were wondering, in case you were worried. Uh, there's somebody with sunglasses uh, uh, on their table. and they're ups are, they, are they yours, ma'am? Are those your sunglasses? They're yours, and, they, and yet they're in front of him? He was holding them for you? Exactly how lame have you become? Well, you, they kept falling out of, out of your pocket. Why weren't you holding them? Do you have a, a little purse or something this evening? Oh, it's a very little purse. Well, why would you carry a very little purse? What? Because a purse has a purpose, and it's to carry your things. Why would you carry a purse? that inadequately held your things to such a degree that you had to find a man two seats away from you at the table. You're, you're ashamed? No, there's no, how are you related to this evening's event, ma'am? He invited you and you said, fine, but you carry my stuff. What a beautiful relationship. How are you related uh, to this event? The agency that he works for in the District of Columbia sponsors the National Building Museum. Well, thanks you. What, 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 thank you. And what agency do you work for? The Commission on the Arts and Humanities. Uh huh. I love the arts and humanities myself. You know, honestly, uh, one of the things I've been railing about for years now is that we need to get computers, uh, uh, smartphones, iPads, uh, tablets, laptops, out of our elementary schools entirely, out, gone, not there, uh, because they are not good for brain development. And the irony is that the things that we know are good for brain development, the arts, uh, PE, green space, good food, are all on the chopping block of every school district every year 
so that we can cram these horrible machines down our children's throats. It's a very bad idea. We were just talking at my table. I was trying to remember the name of someone who wrote a biography of Ben Franklin. I can't remember for the life of me, but I refuse to Google it. Because it's not good for you. You got to think. No one reflects and wonders and drifts anymore. If you have a few minutes, you're staring at your flat thing. Everybody's like that now. I'm telling you, if Robert Frost had lived today, he would have written Whose Woods Are These? I think I'll Google it. It's not good for us. You know, I, I am remiss. I mentioned the ambassador from the kingdom of the ne Netherlands. Uh, and I mentioned the uh, ambassador from Austria, who is so lucky he did not have Venetian blinds in his bedroom as a child. I'm going to give you some time with that. But I forgot to mention that we also have the, the ambassador from Switzerland is here. I have no concept of Switzerland, except for it's surrounded by, is, is that you, sir? Where do you go? Like, I'm always wrong about who the, I'm forever nominating new ambassadors. It's this guy here. And how long have you lived here, sir? For almost three years and difficult transition. It's an excellent place to live. My God, you're a good ambassador. <laughs> Even most of us wouldn't say that. Is that what you do? You just slap a smile on your face every day and tell people this is a good place to live? I'll bet you get invited to a lot of these dinners. Um, you know, the only thing I know about these types of, these, these Nordic-y kind of, these snowy countries is that you kick our butts at the Olympics in the, in the, in the cross-country events every year. The last time when I watched uh, the Olympics, and by the way, cross-country skiing is not a great televised event. Uh, you know, they get up to speeds of this. Uh, but I remember watching, and, and the Amer you know, all these, you know, all these snowy, faraway countries were just zipping over the finish line, and the American women were miles back texting each other. <laughs> Do you ski, Mr. Switzerland Ambassador, sir? Not anymore, uh, not since you've lived in this excellent place to live. Yeah, there's not a lot of skiing going on in DC. Um, but you did, did you grow up skiing? When you were a boy. Yeah, that's kind of the image that I have. I picture like your mom sending you out on skis to get the bread. Hans or whatever your name is. Hans, go get the bread on the skis. That's sort of how we picture it. That's why it's good that you're here. You can fix these inadequacies in our body of knowledge about Switzerland. Hans, get the bread for the family on the skis. Did you have the mittens with the string that connected them, or is that an American thing? We were always losing our mittens, so they used to put a string on them. Uh, so we looked like we got used to being in shackles early on in our lives. Um, did, did you, they have that in Switzerland, the mittens with the string? A long time ago, uh-huh. Wait, back when you skied. That was a long time ago. How do you become an ambassador? Is it like here, where you're kind of a buddy of the head guy and... No, it's not like that there. In Switzerland, you have to actually know something to be the ambassador, is that correct? Do they have like a ski race to determine the ambassador? Hans, go quickly, quickly go. You'll be the ambassador to the nice place to live. Um, and did you move your whole family here, I assume? Is this, is this your wife with you? Oh, why do pe people not sit by their spouses anymore? Is that a thing? Is that like a European thing or is that a thing that we always do? You're not sitting beside your husband. Is that so to continue the ambassador thing so that you can spread the word about Switzerland? I would not have guessed that you were from Switzerland in a million years. You don't look like the stereotype that I have in my head. I think sort of blonde Susie Chapstick with an accent. 
Are there a lot of dark-haired Swiss? There are? See, I know nothing. I'm so glad you're here. Um, what did you do for a living in Switzerland? You did what? Oh, you grew up there. That's all it took? Oh, that's great. And did you grow up skiing? Do you know how to ski? Yeah, it was a, like, a thing that people learned to do. They're like learning to walk everywhere else, right? You just ski right off the bat. Uh huh. And you guys have children? And are, are they here? You have two? One? One is here. Uh huh. And do they think it's a great place to live? Yeah, because they're going to be an ambassador someday themselves. What about the traffic? Does Switzerland have traffic like we have here? Not like here. Yeah, no. It's not, it's not good, is it, ma'am? And have you noticed that when you push the walk, don't walk sign, it has nothing to do with you pushing the button? It just randomly, occasionally comes up. It just gives the, pe the pedestrian something to do with their rage while they stand there. That's a very American thing, deceiving the public. It's a big part of who we are. And if you know what's good for you, you'll get used to it, because that's how we roll here. We trick each other. Look at, our, look at our commercials, for heaven's sakes. It's nothing but trickery. I saw a commercial the other day. There's a, a couple in the kitchen, and, and the, the woman had obviously just done the grocery shopping. And uh, the guy comes into the kitchen, and he's just taking stuff out of the bag and looking at it and not putting it away. And he picks up a box of, of pills and he says, Senecoot? And the word is Senecot, and it's pronounced phonetically. It's, there's nothing tricky about it. And she tur he turns to her and says, what is this? And she says, sometimes I get constipated. <laughs> and there's this long pause, like as if she said she had an STD or something. And then the guy puts the thing back in the bag and leaves. He never put anything away. My guess is that he just pretends to be baffled by stuff in the bag just so he doesn't have to help. He picks up stuff and goes, Cheerios, what are these? <laughs> are the domestic duties split equally between you and, and your husband, ma'am? Would that be a traditional thing in Switzerland to split the domestic, they're not? Is that Switzerland or is that like a balance problem in your relationship? In Switzerland, do the, do the, do the couples split the, uh, split the work? In general, you feel that they do? But he's not really doing his share? Is that, is that what I just heard? Oh my God, we're going to have an international incident here. Oh, this is so awkward. All right, so all the ladies here need to pretend that uh, you do all the work in your homes as well so that these guys won't feel out of place in any way. I'm single, so I do all the work, trust me. Uh, I have 14 cats. Is that something that would happen in Switzerland? Are they that stupid there? I do, I have 14 cats, ma'am. I fall asleep every single night I'm home listening to <laughs> Every single night. Not only that, my cats throw up rubber bands. You guys, if I went and rubber bands came out, I would think to myself, boy, I'm not going to eat those anymore. But my cats apparently just think they got a bad batch. You know, I want to, is, isn't this dick over here? I want to tell you how much I enjoyed your comments. A and, and I loved hearing about building bridges and tunnels and instead of walls. I love that idea, but I have to tell you, I've never understood how a bridge gets built. It's just baffling to me. I mean, you start on one side, right? You start on both sides. Well, how the hell did you get to the other side without the bridge? I mean, now your work's practically done for you because people already had bridges, but before that, the first bridge, sir, did they start on both sides? So it was people that didn't even know each other yet? There's always a way. Is that like an architecture expression?
this is such an uplifting line of work. There's always a way. I love that. In a lot of professions, the, 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 you know, the, the slogan is, we're screwed. So that's just good to hear that the builders don't feel that way. And I was excited to hear that there's a, what is it, the bricklayers union or something was here tonight? Oh my God, I love your work. I've never really seen you do it. Are there hod carriers still? Do you know what a, of course you know what a hod carrier, are there still hod carriers in Brick Lane? Chase, they're not talking to me at all. Where, where were they? Over here, the brick people, the lady with the blue hat, that's a great hat, ma'am. Are you a bricklayer? Oh, you're here with the bricklayer. Huh, is he holding your glasses? Because that's how we do it here. Let's give all the people from other countries uh, the wrong idea of how we do things. And uh, uh, uh. So, uh, you're a bricklayer, sir? Are there still hod carriers? There are. You know, Ed Begley Jr., you know who that is? His father, Ed Begley Sr., who's probably most famous for uh, his role in the movie 12 Angry Men, uh, when he wasn't acting, he was a hod carrier. Isn't that fascinating, sir? Won't you share that with your buddies at the next bricklaying event? So you just... That's, it. That's what you do? You just put them on and shave off the little bit on the side? Does it bother you that now they have like fake stuff that just looks like a brick facade? Does that ever trouble you? Yeah. Yeah, I don't blame you at all, sir. In fact, I come from a background in comedy clubs and uh, the fake brick wall. Very important in comedy for many, many years. But you actually do the real thing. You know, in an earthquake, it's one of the first things to go down is a brick uh, wall. Did you know that, sir? I, w I lived in Santa Monica when the Northridge quake hit. And we don't have a lot of brick in Santa Monica, but that which there was came down right away. Is it because it wasn't done right, sir? You know, I moved from Massachusetts to, to California many years ago, and of course you think, you know, ooh, earthquakes. That's what everybody thinks about California. Even though we no longer have the most earthquakes. You know where it does now in our country? Oklahoma. They say it's not because of fracking, but they don't even count how many they have anymore. They just walk around all the time. It's because of fracking. Uh, but when I first moved to California, one of, the, one of the things I made note of was the instructions on what to do in an earthquake are in the government pages of the phone book. Like there's an earthquake and someone grabs the phone book? That seems odd to me. But one of the things that it, it said, they it, it told you what you're supposed to do during an earthquake. And one of the things is don't spread rumors. Because apparently what was happening is there'd be the big shaker and everybody would dive under a big table and say to each other, you know, George Clooney's breaking up with his wife already. And that was tearing at the fabric of the United States. Uh, anyways, I wasn't asked to say any of that. I just, you know, got thinking, and next thing you know. Uh, all right, anyways, I, I make a lousy uh, MC because I have a hard time, uh, well, remembering anything, but also everything that gets said reminds me of one more thing that I need to say, and it could be something that I said that reminds me of the next thing that I need to say. So you see, there's often not a break. My show was once reviewed as a hostage crisis. Do they have, hey, ma'am, uh, do they have stand-up comics in Switzerland? They do? It's just hard to imagine, isn't it? I don't know, I just picture it as being very echoey there because of the mountains. That's all I know. How, now what made you want to be an ambassador to the, to the United States? What made you want to be an ambassador to the United States? 
You think it's the most exciting place for a diplomat to be? Well, nowadays, yeah. My God, you must have to call the office every few minutes. No, they've changed their mind. He seems different today. Uh-oh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in 1986, the National, the National Building Museum created the Annual Honor Award, which is given out yearly, to recognize those who have made important contributions to our nation's build environment. Tonight, the museum is bestowing its 31st Honor Award with the specific lens of calling attention to important players who have made a profound commitment and lasting contributions to public art, community building. Let me just bask in that word community. Community building and creative placemaking. Jeez, what the hell's creative placemaking? It's a good term. It seems kind of catch-all. Yeah, it's like if you go in your kid's room and they've made a shambles of it. They say, I'm, I'm in line for the 32nd Honor Award for creative placemaking. I love that. Particularly timely, the first award of the evening, there's nothing timely when I'm here. And the first award of the evening is, is going to the national, and listen carefully, this is so, so, so important to, to who we are and where we're going and our future. It is going to the National Endowment for the Arts. As we all know, <laughs> as we all know, their future is uncertain. I can't believe you actually wrote those words. I didn't think we were allowed to talk about it, especially in front of the ambassadors. Ah, as we all know, their future is uncertain, and it seems especially important to call attention tonight to the NEA, who has helped give the arts a seat at the community development table, proving that artists, designers, and arts organizations play an essential role in creating livable and sustainable communities, not to mention creative place spaces. What was it? Pla creative, what was it? Place, place making. It sounds so much like place mat. Uh, let me read that sentence again. Essential role in creating livable and sustainable communities that benefit all of us. Please turn your attention to the screen for a short video about the important, irreplaceable National Endowment for the Arts. Established in 1965, the National Endowment for the Arts gives Americans the opportunity to participate in the arts exercise their imaginations, and develop their creative capacities. Today, the NEA is the only grant maker in the nation that supports arts organizations in all 435 congressional districts. Last year, it recommended more than 2,400 grants in nearly 16,000 communities. The NEA has supported some of the building museum's key exhibitions and projects. Most of these grants go to small and medium-sized organizations and support projects that benefit audiences that otherwise might not have access to arts programming. Like many innovative organizations, the NEA has been caught in the crossfire of politics and culture wars. But its invaluable contribution to the life of our communities has ensured that the agency has survived. This contribution is exemplified by programs like Our Town, which invests in projects that bring diverse partners together to integrate the arts into neighborhood revitalization work, giving the arts a seat at the community development table. The National Building Museum salutes the National Endowment for the Arts for ensuring that artists, designers, and arts organizations play an essential role in creating our livable and sustainable communities. All right, forgive me. I've already forgotten your fearless leader's name. We, Gary. Okay. If 
the, if the building museum were to do a production of the LBJ story, would Gary not be called upon to play LBJ? It's crazy how much, it, and has this ever been noticed before among your population? No, because he rarely looks up. He's so busy creative placemaking that you don't often see his face. It is now my honor to welcome Chairman Gene Chu to the stage to accept the 2017 Honor Award on behalf of the National Endowment for the Arts. Please join me in congratulating her on this great honor. Thank you so much and good evening. It is such a tremendous honor to be here tonight. Uh, the National Endowment for the Arts has supported the National Building Museum since its inception, and we have looked on with pride as the museum has shaped itself into a national cultural leader through the exhibitions that you create and through your educational programs for youth and by connecting the history of this glorious building to the local, national, and international community. So it's really meaningful to be able to receive this acknowledgement and recognition through your 2017 Honor Award. And so to answer your earlier question, the term creative placemaking was conceived about six or seven years ago by the University of Minnesota researchers, Ann Markison and Ann Gadwa, and they articulated so well what we experience in communities across the nation, which was that the arts and artists and culture and traditions play a key role in sparking that vitality in a community. That creativity helped to establish a place where people wanted to live. So the term creative placemaking is relatively new, but the concept itself is not. Creativity, as expressed through the arts, has beautified and strengthened and encouraged equity in communities for centuries, and it wasn't just in large, densely packed urban cities. This vitality is also present in small communities, on Main Street USA, in villages, in rural areas. And community vitality has been, through the arts, a longtime focus of the National Endowment for the Arts. 51 years ago, a year after the NEA was established, our first community development grant was awarded to the University of Wisconsin to strengthen rural communities through the arts. 31 years ago, we established, we helped to establish the Mayor's City Institute on City Design, where mayors from all sizes and shapes of cities work with community design experts to address their own design uh, challenges and strengths. 26 years ago, we were founding partners on the Citizens Institute on Rural Design that connect residents in rural communities across the nation with community design, planning, creative placemaking, professionals work with them. And now through our Our Town grants, we get to integrate the arts into community development projects across the nation. So to date, the NEA has awarded more than $30 million through 389 Our Town grants to communities in all 50 states, as well as Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. So we're very heartened when we see communities of all sizes and shapes come to life because of the arts, because we're very energized when we experience the growth of a creative placemaking field as a whole. And this award is a validation that, yes, the arts do play a significant and meaningful role in sparking vitality in the communities. They're a key factor in encouraging these places to be safe and lively and inclusive and economically vibrant. And we all want to be a part of living in this type of community, a community where we feel like we belong. Thank you so much for giving us this award. Uh, we should have an extra award for that jacket. It's really beautiful. All right, I want to just take a self-indulgent minute to tell you something, uh, because I haven't done that enough. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, you know, uh, Chase mentioned my book earlier. My book is a series of experiments doing things that I or other people uh, thought would make me happy. 
And uh, each chapter is written as an experiment with the hypothesis and the uh, uh, conditions and the field notes, et cetera. Um, but the analysis part of each of the experiments was how, because my question wasn't whether doing something would, would, I would enjoy, I have a sense of what I enjoy. The question was, what could I do that would provide me when I return to my regular life with some sort of umbrella for the invariable, inevitable reigns of, of, of a person's regular life, uh, in my case, uh, raising a house full of kids and animals and being a stand-up comic and, uh, and being stuck being me 24 hours a day. And uh, so one of the chapters, in fact, two of the chapters, were on getting organized. I firmly believed that getting organized would make me happy. And, and, and uh, you know, getting organized is now the, the new big O of women's magazines. Women don't care nearly as much about orgasm as they once did. They'd much rather get organized. Uh, all this is by way of telling you that during the get organized chapter, um, we, I, I hired at one point organizers to help me. And we went through a trunk in my room, and one of the things that we found was letters from when I was in junior high, we called it back then, seventh and eighth grade. I was in the school plays. And I had not seen these letters in, you know, 40 something years, I think. And we came across this treasure trove of letters. And I didn't know most of the people that they were from. They were from members of our community that had come out, adults, the parents of other kids, some people that didn't have kids in our schools, that came out to see the school play and wrote me to tell me how much they enjoyed my performance. And looking back, I cannot tell you, I mean, I remember them from when I received them, I just hadn't seen them in years. I cannot tell you how much that meant to me as a kid. That opportunity not only to be a performer uh, in, a, in a school play when I was a kid, but the idea that the community was that involved that somebody would reach out. And so uh, when I, I see, particularly for the, the um, communities in our country that, that don't have the resources, I was raised in a small town in Massachusetts, very good public schools, but particularly for the com communities that don't have the resources, you know, to bring theater, uh, you know, that kids can participate into a neighborhood is uh, just a life-changing thing to do for everybody involved. And so, Jane, thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. Now, our second honoree of the evening, uh, Brookfield Properties. Brookfield is one of the world's leading real estate developers with projects in cities spanning across New York, London, Berlin, Toronto and Sydney, couldn't they do one thing in one of the countries that was represented here tonight? But beyond their impressive, innovative buildings that are shaping and revitalizing our skylines around the globe, Brookfield is bringing public spaces to life through art. Please turn your attention to the screen for a short video highlighting Brookfield's incredible dedication to all of our communities. Brookfield Properties, one of the world's largest real estate firms, owns and operates vibrant, iconic properties in major cities around the globe. For almost three decades, their award-winning arts and entertainment program, Arts Brookfield, has presented exciting, world-class cultural experiences to hundreds of thousands of people each year. They are produced at indoor and outdoor public spaces at Brookfield's properties to audiences of all ages at no cost. No other real estate company has shown this level of sustained commitment to activating public spaces through art. These programs draw foot traffic to retail stores and restaurants. They provide entertainment and illumination to property residents, workers, and visitors. And they help enliven their communities, making steel, glass, and marble lobbies more connected with the life of the city. By establishing long-term relationships with its arts partners, Brookfield helps to sustain local cultural institutions and visionaries. The National Building Museum salutes Brookfield Properties for its profound commitment to public art, community building, and creative placemaking.
It is now my honor to welcome Sabrina Kanner, Senior Vice President of Design and Construction to the stage to accept the 2017 Honor Award on behalf of Brookfield Properties. Thank you. So making great places requires effort from every single department at Brookfield. It is truly a company-wide collaboration. So on behalf of the entire team Brookfield, thank you to National Building Museum for this honor. We have with us tonight members of our Washington office under the leadership of Greg Meyer. Uh, we have several members from New York, including our CIO, Mark Brown, uh, and many, many friends and associates, many of whom have traveled to be with us here tonight to celebrate with us and to support National Building Museum. So thank you all very much. Public art plays an essential role in successful placemaking. So public art can surprise you, challenge you, provoke you, delight you, it engages you, and it always includes you, connects you to a moment in a place. So thank you to the New York City-based Hungry March Band and to Elisa Martin, our Director of Arts and Events, for creating just this moment for all of us tonight. And thank you very much to the National Building Museum for this wonderful honor and this wonderful evening. Thank you. Do you, do you know why they're not carrying off the awards? Because they're a thousand pounds each. Um, they have yet to uh, award anyone strong enough to lift one. Uh, well, you know, I want to share with you one piece of information that, that I, I, most of you probably don't know about uh, one element of building. 
which is that one time I was walking in downtown Dayton, Ohio, and I passed the Otis elevator building. It's one floor. <laughs> Just something to keep in mind. You've been a wonderful crowd. I think there's to be dancing, although I don't like to picture architects doing it. Uh, have, sir, have you, uh, Mr. Switzerland Ambassador, have you been to an event that had a, what was the name of that band again? The Hungry March Band? Had you seen the Hungry March Band before? I, I thought maybe you were a groupie that followed them everywhere. And that was what brought you here from Switzerland. They were great. I, you know, rarely do you see a trombone, uh, I mean, excuse me, a tuba player get their leg up that high. Uh, I want to thank you so much uh, for being here tonight and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Hang on. No. <laughs> we need to. Thank you. That was a little surprise. OK. One more round of applause for Paula Poundstone. Paula, I want to thank you for being here tonight. She's such a good friend, and her gift to the museum of her time and her talent is remarkable. Thank you so much. And you've made me laugh harder than I have in months. Thank you. So Dick Anderson, colleagues from the National Endowment for the Arts, and Jane Chu and all of the talented people from Brookfield and Sabrina Kanner, I thank you all for being our reason to celebrate tonight. We feel honored to be able to recognize each of you and the tremendous impact you've had on making our lives and our communities better, more vibrant, and more enriching. Congratulations again to all of you. And now, and now, are you ready to continue the celebration? That's the cue. The fun continues back at the West Court where we kicked off the evening, so stay with us for the after party, cocktails, music, and more fun. Thank you all. <laughs>